land and for, for uh, 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 seed and all of that, they had to uh, grow. They weren't allowed to have gardens. They right. had to grow that crop, whatever that crop was, mm -hmm. right up to the front door, mm -hmm. right up to the wall. Right. And so we see in that era, people make a shift from having having their own gardens, maybe raising a pig, um, maybe even having a milk cow, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly having gardens and shell beans and, and uh, dry beans and pumpkins and, and, uh, and greens. Uh, in a climate, of course, that had a very short winter, so they didn't have to put too much by, right. and they could grow lots of sweet potatoes and, uh, and, and uh, uh, even white potatoes. But suddenly they're cut off, and they're thrown on the, uh, the if we, I hate to say goodwill because it isn't goodwill, right. the bad will actually of these owners and, and ex-masters mm. who sell, start selling the food that they are selling out of their own uh, <laughs> company store. Right. So people are thrown onto the company store or the store in town. Mm -hmm. And what are they able to get there? Well, especially if they're having to get it on the tick, you know, uh, mm -hmm. on credit. Mm -hmm. They're going to get meat, meal, and molasses. Mm. And so we see the beginning prevalence among poor white farmers and poor black farmers of, of the three ends the, that are so dangerous because, again, by the uh, beginning of the 20th century, we've also begun to see pellagra, the great scourge of uh, that was a great killer, killed as many as 200,000 people a year in this country. Pellagra. Yeah. Pellagra. What is it? And that? it comes from, it's a dietary deficiency disease uh. caused by eating cornmeal that has been degermed. Wow. You know, every other culture ate cornmeal for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. the, of course, the Native Americans in Mesoamerica, uh, the Aztecs, the Mayans, all of them, they all nixtamalized their corn. They <coughs> cooked it in a lime or alkaline solution, mm -hmm. which helps break down uh, various compounds so that it releases those B vitamins, mm -hmm. and especially then in combination with beans, the proteins in beans and mm -hmm. uh, and then fresh vegetables of you know the tomato or whatever mm -hmm. they could live on a very simple diet mm -hmm. of tortillas and and beans and corn and maize mm -hmm. could you know because they ate most of their corn as nixtamal. Mm -hmm. Now in the south they use much the same process and that's what hominy is. Mm -hmm. Hominy mm -hmm. is produced the same way. It's that fluffy mm -hmm. uh, white. Mm -hmm. Uh, usually use white corn, but still does the same thing. It's a, and it makes that nice sticky kind of texture. I don't know if you if you like mm -hmm. hominy. If, um, now you can basically only get it in cans, but you can make it yourself. It's yeah. really lovely to yeah. make. Yeah. And um, so you still had good corn. Uh, plus you had even your cornmeal was better because it had the had the germ in it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now suddenly industry has discovered how to. They've got all of this corn. It's now growing in the Midwest and all of these opening lands of the of, of South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, all these places where now they have varieties of corn that can flourish at that latitude. Right. And they're producing all this corn. And it's, we're a nation that eats a lot of corn. corn. We eat a lot of cornmeal and, and all over. It's not just region, regionally. And, but they need to ship it, and they need to ship it so it isn't rancid when it gets where it's going. And so de-germinated de -germinate, de cornmeal, which a lot of like Quaker oats and those begin to be sold. Well, now you have populations who are at risk because it's the only source of cornmeal that they really have. They're not growing their own. It's not really grown locally and being milled locally. Uh, anymore, uh, and so poor, poor people. We're also sending this corn uh, as part of our, you know, outreach, whatever you want to call it, to places like Italy. Really? We're also beginning to produce and understand. Well, you've got to de-germ this stuff to make it last long enough to ship it, right? And so, where do we see pellagra? We see it in this country. We see wow. it in Italy. We see it in parts of uh, the West African coast of uh, throughout many cultures, mm. because they too are be being sent or given mm -hmm. or are making de-germinated cornmeal. That mm. you know now, cornmeal was something brand new mm. Mm. Uh, in the. By about 
15, 25 to 35 or 40 uh, Z maize is being beginning to be grown in various West African cultures. Mm -hmm. Catches on very fast because of its speed of growth, the fact you can feed animals. Mm -hmm. All the leaves and stuff are edible by animals. The corn itself is prolific and, and it's delicious and it makes up, you know, you can, in some hot climates, you can almost grow two crops a year. Mm. In the same way with Imopia batata, the sweet potato, mm -hmm. the New World sweet potato, mm -hmm. which, of course, has grafted on the name of yam because mm -hmm. it could be prepared much the way the that diaspora, mm -hmm. the traditional uh, Old World yam, was prepared. But the, um, the New World yam, you could eat the leaves, mm -hmm. animals could eat the leaves, mm -hmm. um, uh, they're just, you know, it's an amazing vegetable that has, but you can do the same thing. You can pound it into a paste and, and eat it, so it was very well. People tend to um, to take on, to a, take on a new food. People are very conservative. People are very conservative about new foods. Um, you take on a new food that resembles something you've either already eaten or that cooks very much like something you already cook. Um, or grows very much like something you've already grown. Uh, you know, it has to have. Some, you have to find a thing in it that says, "Oh, I, 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 I kind of feel comfortable with that because it's very much like." In the same way that the peanut, the cacahuate, is taken to uh, Western Africa, and what does it resemble? Well, the bombara, the bombara bamba, So it's very similar. Um, it kind of has a, you know, has a little nut in the thing, and so suddenly you've got the goober, you know, and, and uh, the name doesn't travel because it's a kind of a difficult name for some reason, but um, I've always loved the name Kakawa because it's just kind of a neat, a neat name. But it has, um, so those, those transferences often then become the foodstuffs that are packed into the slavers' ships as they bring their illicit cargoes mm -hmm. into Brazil, Central America, uh, Mexico, and then ultimately North America. North America doesn't begin to receive any uh, large number of Africans until about 1690. Uh, before that, the population might range, I know in 1660 uh, there were only 2,000 black people in the right. whole of North America right. Right. In, in, the, in the colonies. Yeah. Yeah. So the number suddenly escalates right at the end of the, the century, century, and that comes from rice culture and um, uh, and tobacco culture. Mm. So when they're bringing people uh, to the Caribbean, and a lot of people that are hitting North America have already transshipped from the Caribbean, Caribbean and other places there. Barbados. It's kind of a, we're just an outpost. Mm -hmm. We are a totally unimportant outpost on the far fringes of the British Empire. Ain't nobody give a damn about British North America. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have made ourselves the center of the world, but <laughs> and we certainly did become so, but we did not start so. And so we are getting, um, it, it, it isn't until like the 17. 30s and 40s that we begin to get direct shipments of West Africans into British North America. And that makes a very strong difference of people who are coming directly from, from uh, often warfare mm -hmm. and other circumstances, uh, as opposed to say people who have already spent weeks, months, even years in the Caribbean or and have survived somehow uh, parts of South American slavery and, uh, and arrive here. So there's lots of different, we have lots more tea, so feel, feel, please feel free to Thank yell you. when you need more. Um, and so <coughs> by the time people get here, they are in that uh, 1690 to 1730, uh, West Africans are already more than a hundred years familiar with Z maize, with Emopia batata with uh, cacahuate, with chiles, with all of these new world foods uh, have begun to be taken over. The, the, the um, uh, calabash, you know the calabash is a new world, is a new world plant? Yeah, that was, because it, it, it was a great, you know, as a vessel. But it's a new, it's a new world vessel. Um, and so we have Farmers who, by the time they get to be in the in the 18th century, um, 
they're already coming from people who are familiar with these things. And so when they're then introduced to something like the collard, which is a direct descendant of the colwort, which comes from places like Belgium and Flanders and the, the Baltic, uh, Northern European areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, why don't we do that and then be ready mm -hmm. to... Uh, they're taking their already deep familiarity with greens of all kinds, the amaranth and other forms of, of greens that are... Yeah, <laughs> you can keep it whatever you want. Oh, just that? Yeah, yeah, keep it right there. You can do it to more. Right, we ain't touching nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and you asked so nice to go. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it, it was like a plea. It wasn't even a plea. Would you like to be here? Yes, please. Right. Uh, please don't hit me. And so they, they, they arrive, and uh, many people, uh, particularly women who have been enslaved in households, naturally become the cooks uh, in these elite households along the Atlantic. And they're already familiar, like I say, with cooking with greens, cooking with garlic, cooking with um, uh, um, uh, uh, well, they're not so much, it depends, they've learned how to, to cook with pork if right. they came from Muslim societies mm -hmm. uh, because pork was really the ubiquitous food. You just, if, you, if you wanted animal protein, that's what you were going to have. Mm -hmm. and, and it would appear that, that uh, those of a Muslim uh, uh, from Muslim societies just had to make kind of a universal shift mm -hmm. and forgive themselves, right. and, and, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and eat the food that they had to have because they needed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure that transition was hard for many individual people. Uh, uh, and I don't mean to make light of it, but it does mean that by the, easily the 1750s, uh, African Americans in the colonies are primarily pork eaters with a little bit of beef, some wild game, uh, fish if they live in an estuarial and a, a part of a fishing community. Uh, if they're in South Carolina, they're eating broken rice, you know, mm -hmm. the, the leftover broken rice and a little bit of corn because all the other colonies are shipping them corn, so they still eat corn. Uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, you know, whatever garden truck they can grow, they've learned, as have the English, about pumpkins. And you know, it doesn't take too many seeds. Everybody's had an errant seed grow in your compost pit, and there you got yeah. three great big kushaws, you know, 25, you know, 25 mm -hmm. pounds each. So it doesn't take much to start growing this stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, without being, I do want to debunk kind of a myth because it, I think it's not a helpful myth. I think it's one that doesn't grapple with the real. Uh, it's from, it's kind of an urban Afrocentric myth of how the food, how these African foods got to the New World. Well, these slavers, they knew they had to have food in the hold for weeks and weeks for people to eat. Right. And they knew that when they got them to wherever they were going, right. they had to immediately grow gardens because that was the only way that you could eat. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they brought stuff ready to, for people, seeds and stuff mm -hmm. for people to grow, and they knew that they could grow them. So the tradition of somehow African women uh, braiding rice into their hair mm -hmm. could conceivably have a symbolic value mm -hmm. and some women may de indeed have done it so, to have a feeling of, of connection to their home place. Mm -hmm. But given the humidity and the terrible, terrible conditions uh, on these ships, nothing viable could have conceivably lived long enough to have become the basis for foodstuffs. And I say it, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say it because uh, we, we are all often working with very urban, very young people who have no sense of the seasons, of plants, of, you know, and for which, uh, for whom such a story has a great deal of appeal. It has a, it has a survival uh, despite the long odds, the, uh, uh, an edge to it. And we, and we all love those stories. But they're not consonant with the amazing and brilliant work that people did when they got here. They took those loads of seeds, 
the bags of seed or the slips that they that they were given mm -hmm. and they went out and using Swidden agriculture which is to cut down the trees and burn everything to put the ash down on the ground and then with that digging digging stick or digging hoe mm -hmm. to plant all that and to, so that and they knew about how to do it because they were agricultural people in the main even mm -hmm. men who had been warriors mm -hmm. knew about agriculture they had lived in their mother's compounds until they were a certain age they knew the culture from which they came uh, even the fact that many that the age group was between 14 and 45 was the average mm -hmm. age that people they still were in uh, uh, any 14-year-old that has worked in a, on a farm from the time he was a little child or she was a little child uh, knows quite a bit about, you know, mama can send them out to milk the cow or, you know, turn the, uh, you know, empty, uh, clean out the hog pen or, or whatever. So even at 14, they could arrive with a body of cultural knowledge. You get any older than that, you know, you've got to. So by the 1750s, we have in British North America, a self-replicating population of black people mm -hmm. where the balance between men and women very unusual compared to Central and South America and the Caribbean even enough men and enough women to begin to create stable families mm -hmm. yes despite the sales and all of the other we still have families able to have children that are likely to live to adulthood yeah. mm. and yeah. that's one of those tipping points yeah. so that we have this uh, uh, this stable group of black people to form the core of, uh, uh, of who we then became so we're going to serve our entree and each of you let's see you're going to clear this right there because this is going to come right between you to start oh and we're going to bring one for you guys so you're going to clear just that space between you <coughs> and we're going to have fricassee chicken a oh fricassee boy. of chicken <laughs> we're going to have as my dad used to say just to be funny collier with greens <laughs> oh my God. because he was always convinced that do you all know the word dicky no. no. Oh no. Okay. Well, Daddy always said "dicky people," which, but by that he meant what he really meant was black people who go to church, oh, and no. he was not churchy at all. Oh, so mm -hmm. he, uh, he, uh, he, 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 "dicky black folks" is what he would say. So, <laughs> so then he would say they eat them, but they call them collier and beans. Yeah, yeah. And um, then we have. Um, Mac and cheese, and this is mac and cheese a la Monticello. Yes. Um, so now we have moved from uh, service uh, a la Russe, where you uh, get your food on a plate that's already been served to you and portioned out. And now we're moving to service a la France, which is really a family affair. And you guys are going to uh, serve each other, serve uh, this to each other, serve your